So today's message is the future is near. We're going to talk about how you know many of the things that we think of as far off and out there someplace actually could happen very quickly in the next few years or the next couple of decades. And uh, I've got a nice blue-eyed android looking creature here to sort of represent the future for us. And you can tell maybe from that we're going to talk about some things like artificial intelligence and computers. And we're going to talk about something called the technological singularity today, which I promised at the beginning of this series we'd get to. So what is going on out there in the world of technology? Well, most of us notice it here and there a little bit. It touches our individual lives. But there's a lot going on we may not be aware of. You know, we all have, most of us have smartphones, and our smartphones have more and more apps to do more and more different things. And of course, now they're talking about self-driving cars and automation of all kinds. Uh, a lot of things that you buy these days, some, if not all, of the process of making it was done by robots in robot factories. You can go to a robot hotel now here in Japan, where from the time you check in till you leave and the cleaning of your room is all done by robots at one place. They're testing that, not to see whether it will work, they know it'll work, to see whether people will like it or not, and whether it'll be cost effective, you know. And with this comes from, you know, the accumulation of human knowledge, you know. People have been around for quite a while now, and we learn things, and we write them down, we share them with others, and we begin to build up more and more information and knowledge about the world and about how to do things. Now here's some estimates. These are my estimates, but they're based on looking at estimates by several experts and kind of combining them into a very rough and simple thing. It's a rough estimate for how long it takes for the sum of all human knowledge to double. Well, we look at it and we say maybe from 500 AD to 1500 AD, the total amount of knowledge the human race had doubled. It took a thousand years. But then from 1800 to 1900, it doubled again in only 100 years. There's acceleration, it's happening faster. And probably 2017 to 2018 in one year, the total sum of human knowledge completely doubled to twice as much as it was before through all the research going on, all the different things that are happening with so many millions of people working on it. And very soon the sum of human knowledge may double every day or in the near future, maybe every hour. It's just accelerating so fast at how much information is accumulating. Because now not only do we have human researches, we have artificial intelligent agents running that develop knowledge and stuff and store it for us in vast data banks so we can call upon it at any time and come up with it. So we're standing, so to speak, in a very special time. So here's what it looks like going forward. We're facing an explosion of data, data storage, communications, computing power, and human knowledge. And we are right there on the cusp where it's accelerating, but suddenly they think, many experts think it's just going to take off and go almost vertical. Because as more and more of these artificially intelligent agents and computers begin to develop knowledge directly, information, there's no limit almost to how fast it can accumulate. Will we be able to use all that information? Will we know what to do with it? Who knows? That's another question. But technology is just going to explode in the very near future. It's been moving faster and faster. You've probably seen, you know, some of us remember when you had to actually dial your phone. We still say that sometimes, dial your phone. That was because it had a dial. <laughs> and then it got buttons, you know. My grandmother, she had a phone, it was a crank. You had to crank it to generate the electricity to call somebody. Well, now we all have, you know, a smartphone in our pocket. And our smartphones are actually very sophisticated computers that can do all kinds of things right there in our pocket. You know, a smartphone today is more powerful than a supercomputer was when I was a kid. And it's just accelerating. And we're looking at this, the explosion is bringing more and more the topic of artificial intelligence into play. Now, a lot of people throw this idea around artificial intelligence. You know, and it's, the meaning is so broad, it can mean so many different things to different people. 
Clearly, it's using computing power to behave in intelligent or simulated intelligent ways. But let's narrow it down by dividing it into categories so we know what we're talking about. They have what they call artificial narrow intelligence. This is uh, computerized algorithms and things that become very good at doing some particular type of task. You know, now world chess, man, world chess champion is a computer. You know, if you let them compete, there's no human alive that can beat the, the faster computers and play a better game of chess. And the last couple of years now, Go, which is actually vastly more complex than chess, now Go is something we can have computer experts play Go. And we also have the self-driving cars, Google search, online advertising industry. A lot of people, you know, you notice these things with the working with your cell phone or your searches on your computer or something maybe, and you're kind of like, well, that's weird, and it shows up. You kind of, you don't even realize how much information companies out there have or how much is available about you. Uh, a guy got in trouble, you know, about 10 years ago when he made an offhand comment talking in front of his stockholders about how great his company was and how great their information was. And he made an offhand comment and he said, you know, uh, we, we run a drugstore chain. And he says, we know when women are pregnant before their husbands or doctors know because we map their buying patterns and the things they look at. Well, I guarantee you now Google practically knows if you're pregnant before you do. <laughs> you know, certainly very, very soon something tips in a little algorithm up there in the data cloud and Google marks you as pregnant or not pregnant or coming down with the flu or healthy. You know, they keep track of you. They're keeping you under very close watch. And you can be worried about that or you can appreciate that they care <laughs> about your money <laughs> and how to get it. <laughs> no. But actually, a lot of these algorithms are used for health now. And more and more doctors are beginning to rely on computer assistance in various ways uh, for their work and for operations even and surgeries, you know. These things are coming into play. Artificial narrow intelligence, AI, is very much here now. Every day in ways you don't understand, you interact with artificial narrow intelligence even through your smartphone and how it works to find the cell towers it connects to. You know, and this is computer algorithms. They're designed for particular tasks and they're very, very good at those tasks. Much better than any human could be at that particular little task. And they're getting better and there's more different tasks they can do. And some computers can do a variety of tasks very well. And you know, your cell phone would be one of those. It can do a lot of different things very well uh, with the software algorithms. Of course, you have to steer, you have to drive. You know, it doesn't do it by itself for the most part. But then we have what we call AGI, artificial general intelligence. Artificial general intelligence is when we have computers that are human-like in many skill areas, where they could take exams or do tasks and compete with people in many, many different areas, not just in one or two specialties, but they would be better at writing a book than you, better at playing chess than you, better at driving a car than you, many different functions, very flexible, capable ability to do a lot of different tasks. Now, we don't have AGI yet, but a lot of people are working on it, and this is the next big thing. Every major technology company has a section working on AGI-related topics. Google has one of the biggest ones. And Google got theirs by buying a company called DeepMind, which was one of the most advanced AGI companies in existence. And Google just come along and bought it because this is a lot, a lot of the future is in this. And then there's artificial superintelligence, which is what some people think of first when they think of AI, is they think of superintelligent machines that are much uh, faster and more capable than humans. And you know, you start to get things like Terminator scenarios and stuff and Skynet and all of these things that you see in fiction. Usually those involve some level of artificial superintelligence uh, where the computers can not only keep up with the people, but they can outrun them in almost every area, in almost every task. And ASI is still out there somewhere. It's out in the future. And some people say it'll never happen. We'll never get there. Some people never say, say we'll never have true artificial general intelligence. 
but the current trend line it looks like we probably will and a lot of experts think that if we have AGI ASI will not be far behind so let's take a look at a couple of examples this is one of the leading edge artificial narrow intelligence things this is the summit supercomputer it's currently the fastest supercomputer in the world uh, it's being used at the moment for climate research uh, at uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratories in the United States and they're modeling the climate of the planet you know in here and artificial narrow intelligence to estimate what will happen in things uh, it does up to 200 petaflops it was timed out in November of 2018 if you're not familiar with petaflops it's not a word we use every day most of us that's 2 times 10 to the 17th or 2 with 17 zeros after it floating point operations per second, mouth calculations per second. Uh, that's probably a little hard for some people to get their arms around as well, but if you have an iPhone XS in your pocket, this has more speed than 40,000 iPhone S XSs running at the same time. And it's pretty quick, it can do a lot of things. But some of the big news is how fast it's changed. The first computer that could do one petaflop was 10 years ago. So in 10 years, it's increased by a factor of 200, how fast we're doing calculations. Uh, for five years, China had the fastest computer in the world. Now it's back in the USA. Japan has had the fastest computer a couple of times. Japan, USA, and China are really the only players uh, at the leading edge of fastest computers over the last 20 years. Although there are some European people who are not far behind, they can't keep up at the moment. So this is artificial narrow intelligence, cutting edge, very, very powerful, can do amazing things, but it cannot do uh, a general variety of many different types of tasks, certainly not at the same time, but it has a tremendous ability in a task you give it one at a time. Now, as we move toward AGI, I mentioned DeepMind a moment ago. This is Demis Hassabis. He was the founder of DeepMind. And what DeepMind is doing is instead of programmers writing algorithms on how to do specific tasks, they're writing general algorithms in the DeepMind project to be able to teach the computer not how to do something, but how to learn how to do things in general. So DeepMind uh, company uh, had AlphaGo, which was the one that won the Go championship uh, a while back, the first computer really to compete at Go. And they didn't program it how to play Go. They programmed it how to learn, they defined the rules of Go, and it split into and played itself for a week or something, and then it was an expert, you know, reviewing other games and stuff. It doesn't have to be programmed for a specific task. You just set the parameters, and it will learn how to do it through trial and error. Uh, now it can play most online games that you see, or most uh, games it can play very, very well and it can learn how to play them without being told specifically anything but the rules of the game and defining how the game works. And then it can go out and it can practice on its own and come back and say, okay, I'm ready to take on the master and win the championship. You know, So this deep learning type of thing is a whole new thing. Uh, it's The concept's been around for quite a while, but computers that can actually do on their own deep learning is a pretty much a new thing. Now. This computer, DeepMind, is not used just for games. It's also used in searching for cures for cancer and developing all kinds of health applications and things. So they're using it in many different ways because it can basically turn anything into a game internally to itself and look for the best solutions. So Demis says what we're working on is potentially a meta solution to any problem. Any problem you can think of, you give it to the computer and it will come back with the answer or the solution. The motto of DeepMind company is solve intelligence. Not solve particular problems that require intelligence, but solve intelligence itself. What is intelligence? How can you teach a computer to be intelligent? And then use it to make the world a better place. So Demis is very optimistic about the future of this. Some people are a little more worried <laughs> about how this could all turn out. Uh, he's a pretty positive guy, and this is his work. Uh, they're working on artificial general intelligence. So artificial general intelligence placed into a robot or android type of creature. 
uh, would begin to appear very human in many, many ways in its behaviors, you know. You can sit there and contemplate, you know, for example, mm, thinking about it, you know. You start to take on aspects of human behavior more and more. But then the next leap, which we don't know whether we'll get there or not, but if we do, that would be artificial superintelligence. And now we're going to talk about uh, being able to develop, you know, the thing itself could just be a computer or a box, could be in any shape or form, but inevitably people will put these into Android simulated people type of constructs at some point. And it may get to where it's very difficult to tell a artificially super intelligent computer uh, far more capable than Einstein, you know, and able to shape their own body and stuff to be however beautiful or ugly or whatever they want. They can redesign themselves not only internally but externally and manufacture anything they want. So you really are looking at some very wild out there scenarios. Uh, and of course they don't have to be in a human factor. It could be your cat could be super intelligent. You know, we had uh, pet robot dogs here, Wabo, Ibo, you know, you, that could be taken to the next level. But this is where you get into what we call the technological singularity. When the technology just takes off, it's such like going up like a rocket and it's accelerating so fast because computers are no longer waiting for people to design them, they're redesigning themselves. And a computer like DeepMind, you can see in the future as it develops, it will be able to design a better computer than itself. And that better computer will be able to design yet a better computer and so forth, accelerating the bar to where they accomplish in an hour what it might take humanity 10 centuries to do in terms of redesign and improvement. So here's the hypothesis of the technological singulator. ASI will result in runaway technological growth leading to sudden radical change in our world. Sudden radical change. What people don't know is what direction it'll go. Will it go in the direction of computers figuring out how to solve all diseases and to cure everything and to give us long lives and to virtually give people immortality and to have us live in a utopia type thing where anything that would be positive and good we would want would be available? Or will it go in the other direction and ASI will wipe out humanity because they'll no longer see us as useful but as a threat to them? Science fiction in the last 10 years or 20 years has produced a lot of the, uh, the negative scenarios, how ASI could destroy everything. And there are a lot of people who are very worried about that. So how far out is this? Well, nobody knows for sure whether ASI is even possible or even AGI, but a lot of experts think so. This is what Ray Kurzweil says. He spent a lot of his life uh, as a futurist, you know, studying what might happen in the future, an inventor. He says, artificial intelligence will re reach human levels by around 2029. That would be nine years away to artificial general intelligence, uh, where you could have basically computers that appear to be people. Follow that out further to say 2045, we will have multiplied the intelligence, the human biological machine intelligence of our civilization a billion fold. Now he's talking about ASI, artificial superintelligence. So Ray Kurzweil at least thinks this may only be like nine or 10 years away, artificial general intelligence, and coming not long after that, artificial superintelligence. So that's why I say the future is near. The future is nearer than you think, very likely. Uh, we tend to think because we can't see what's going to happen next year or 10 years from now. We only see what we've come up to, you know, the past, you know, we tend to think the future will sort of like continue like on like the past gradually. But what we don't see is that acceleration because we don't experience it in our own lifetime that much. But now we're going to start experiencing the acceleration. Before the rate of progress was fairly constant in a human lifetime. Now it's not. Now the rate of progress is far faster than a human lifetime. Many people, the job they work at today will com be completely taken over by robots in a few years, you know. And other jobs may be done by humans forever, but what jobs will they be? 
Will they be good jobs that we like or will the computers make us all street sweepers because it's more efficient than having a computer do it? Yeah, you know, <laughs> more cost effective. So we don't know exactly where this is going, but it could be a very exciting. Elon Musk is pessimistic and he's a leading developer of artificial neurointelligence. He knows a lot about the field. You know, everybody knows uh, his companies, uh, Tesla is working on self-driving cars and things, you know, the SpaceX, they're working on a lot of automation. So he knows a great deal about artificial neurointelligence. He thinks it's coming and he thinks we should be worried. Elon Musk says, with artificial intelligence, we're summoning the demon. And what he means is that if we achieve ASI, it will wipe us out because it will not be friendly to humanity. It will no longer see us as useful. At best, it will keep us as pets. <laughs> That's his view. He's very worried about it and he thinks we need, uh, he's, he's an entrepreneur and a businessman. He says we need government regulation, government control, not only in the USA, but in every country to define how far you can go in developing artificially intelligent computers and to draw a line and say nobody's allowed to cross this line in the capabilities of their computers because it's too dangerous to everybody on the planet. So he's worried about it. Colin Angle, the founder of iRobot, if you've seen the robot vacuum cleaners, that's one of his products, you know, the vacuums your floor for you and they have lots of other products at iRobot. He's more positive. He said it's going to be interesting to see how society deals with artificial intelligence, but it will definitely be cool. <laughs> <You know? laughs> he thinks this is all going to be a lot of fun. He's not worried about it at all. He thinks it's all good, all good. Uh, other people have a more nuanced view. This is Ole Hagstrom. He's a professor of mathematical statistics in Chalmers University. Well, mathematical statistics is a core discipline for development of artificial intelligence, so he knows a lot about this too. He says the emergence of superintelligence may, if we prepared for it with sufficient care, turn out to be the best thing that ever happened to humanity, but also comes with severe catastrophic risk. In other words, he's saying this could be really good, but we had better be very, very careful what we do with these computers. You know. I don't know how many people are aware that the uh, drones that are used for surveillance by the various militaries of the world, they now have armed ones. They have ones that have their own missiles and stuff. And those are artificially intelligent drones with a narrow artificial intelligence. Uh, currently, in the US at least, we require a human operator to be in the loop and to make the decision about firing weapons. But there's no, the platform is completely capable of firing weapons on its own based on the data it's given of finding the quote enemy and shooting them without any further input other than to define who's the enemy this year. <laughs> so uh, these platforms are pretty scary, you know, and autonomous robot uh, machines that carry guns and fight the ground war, those are being developed too and are being tested. So there could be a lot of scary stuff out there. So we need to be really careful. What do we do with AI? China is now selling armed drones to many countries. And will all of those countries be careful about setting the parameters of who's an enemy? Or will some of them be sloppy and end up shooting people they don't mean to? We don't know. So here's a different question. We have the technology question, but we also have the ethics question. Is an AGI or an ASI a artificial general intelligence that's human-like or an artificial super intelligence that's, you know, more capable than a human being in many ways. Is it a person? Now, a lot of us might immediately say no, but it would depend very much on how we define what is a person. And a lot of people are struggling with this because if it's a person, then it has rights like human rights. You can't just pull the plug on it because it misbehaved. You have to figure out what are you going to do? Do you put an ASI in jail? It'll get out. You can't keep it in. It's smarter than you. you know? <laughs> this is pretty crazy stuff. And what's going to happen? I don't know. But this question will be core. And there's already one country in the world that has recognized artificial intelligence as having rights as persons. So it's on the table. It's not just science fiction. The future is near. So in the Western world, for the last 400 years or so, 
We have focused very much in the Western world on defining personhood in terms of ability to think, of the mind. What is the mind like? And we have looked at personhood in this way. And that's one of the reasons that people struggle with this issue of abortion. And some people are supportive of abortion because it's say it's not a person because it's not yet really developed a mind. So it's just like, you know, a pet or something at most, or maybe an insect until it develops a mind. And the Western idea of thinking this way kind of just started with Descartes. And uh, Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. Uh, and this is a very famous statement, French philosopher, a lot of people have heard it. And what we don't notice, it sounds sort of clever, and it is in a way, you know, but it places identity completely in the mind and the thoughts, not in the body, not in relationships, you know. <clears throat> the Eastern world, Japan even, probably, and certainly other Eastern countries, have not really accepted this idea that our identity as a person is entirely what happens in the mind, but is heavily accepted in the West. But is it right? Now, I probably confuse people by introducing the idea of abortion, because that has many, many other issues besides this issue. But even in the Christian church, a lot of the church does not accept the idea that the mind is what makes a person, uh, uh, a human being into a person, so to speak, and gives them personhood. The Eastern Orthodox Church does not accept that idea. This is John Zizoulis. He's the Metropolitan of Pergamon, which is like the bishop. Uh, that's an interesting historical study in itself. If you've been to Pergamon, you know it's nothing but a mound and nobody lives there. <laughs> uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church doesn't give up easily on these things. So he is legally the bishop or the Metropolitan of Pergamon. And if it's ever rebuilt, he'll be the senior religious leader there. So. John Zizoulis, he says, the person is an identity that emerges through relationship. It is an I that can, only, that can exist only as long as it relates to a thou, which affirms its existence and its otherness. So what he's saying by choosing the word thou is he's saying, you know, you, you become a person really by your relationship with God, the thou, something greater than you. That's where you become a person. And if you have no relationship to something greater than you or to something other than yourself, otherness, other people or something, if you don't have that, you're not really a person in his mind. This is an interesting idea, and I think it's a very foreign idea to people who are trained in the West and maybe even to Japanese people. I don't know. This may sound a little strange. But is it wrong? That's a different question. Or is he really hitting upon something very important. Now, it's interesting to me that his way of looking at personhood probably is much closer to what our Bible presents. You know, the Bible generally defines people in terms of relationships, right? If you look at it, it rarely talks about somebody in terms of an abstract intellect or an idea. You know, look at Jesus here in Luke chapter 3, verse 23 to 38. We have a genealogy, you know, it's this long. I really cut it down with just a little dot, dot, dot. Now, Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God, leaving out a big middle section there. But you see what they're doing is Luke is defining Jesus as a person in terms of his relationship to his ancestors. And when we think of our Christian faith, how is it defined? How do we do it? We do it in terms of relationship, right? Uh, at least the conservative church, you know, that looks at their Bible and they look at it and say, relationship with Jesus Christ is the core idea in Christianity. It's our adoption as children of God that makes us people in God's kingdom, you know? So the Bible is very much focused on relationship. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. We can see our relationship with God in terms of how Jesus, through his work on the cross, his resurrection, has repaired or reconciled us in that relationship, and there is our identity. Well, 
the Eastern Orthodox theologian John Zazulus is much closer to the heart of that type of idea because he defines personhood in terms of relationship to start with. He's much closer to what the Bible was like. In the Western world, our thinking completely changed after the time of Descartes and things and other, French, other philosophers of that era into rationalistic and we began to focus on the person as a mental rational being not as a person in relationship to others. Things to think about, strange philosophy you may feel. But this will come back into play when we talk about is a artificially intelligent being a person. It may not depend so much on how smart it is, but on what kind of relationships it has. That'll be an interesting idea, both legally and ethically, technological. You know, can you be friends with a computer? Hmm, a lot of people will certainly think so. We'll find out what happens. So, the technological singularity. What kind of future will it bring? Will it happen? Will it bring a utopia or a disaster? You know, this uh, picture is kind of in the mood of Elon Musk, you know, we're summoning the demon, you know, with artificial intelligence. <laughs> but other people are much more positive. So, what kind of future do we have? Now, I've been talking here about the technological aspects of that and what the world that we live in will be like. But turn it around and look at it in terms of the Bible or the, or the Christian faith. And we know what our future is. Our future is with God in heaven. Whatever happens on this earth, you know, we want it to turn out well on this earth. But if it doesn't, that's not where our real future and our real home is anyway. Revelation chapter 21 verse 34 Tell us a little bit about our, our real home, our future. Now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. So yeah, there's gonna be big changes ahead here on earth, but our home is in heaven really. So we don't have to be worried or fearful about what happens with super intelligence and things, you know, because we trust in the Lord God and in his promises to us ultimately. But we should be concerned because God has also given us a stewardship over this earth and love of our neighbor, we should protect them. And I think we have to think carefully about artificial intelligence and where it's going and how far should it be allowed to go? And that's something Elon Musk is raising the flag on. How far should we let this go? And it, he's a proponent up to a point, but he wants to draw a line. Or he thinks the line should be drawn at least. But we have a home in heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, thank you for giving us a reconciled relationship with you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to trust in you for all things, to be diligent in doing the things we need to do, should do here on earth, but ultimately our faith, our trust, our hope is in you. Help us to love you, to love Jesus Christ, our Savior, to love the Holy Spirit. Help us to love our neighbor and even our enemy. Give us wisdom individually, as nations, as peoples, and as all of humanity, wisdom to know what we should and should not do, how far to go and no further on some of this technology and these different things. We need great wisdom and we do not know the answers. Lead and guide in these things, but most of all, help us to have a relationship with you, each and every person, through the love of Christ, through his cross, to have a reconciled relationship with our Heavenly Father and a home in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.